Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those connected by phone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would like to now turn the meeting over to your moderator, Megan Rossetter, Program Officer at Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second session in this special on-call series, A Collaborative Approach to a Chronic Care Problem, Evaluative Results from the Atlantic Healthcare Collaboration. Today we will continue exploring results and lessons from CFHI's Atlantic Healthcare Collaboration, a pan-regional quality improvement collaborative for improving care for patients with chronic disease across the Atlantic provinces, to inform strategies for designing, implementing, and evaluating quality improvement collaboratives. I'm Megan Rossiter and I'm pleased to be your host today. This series has more than 200 registrants joining in for live webinars and recordings and resources from across the country. We're pleased to be providing simultaneous interpretation on today's call for a Francophone audience. As I introduce our speakers, please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box on the right of your screen, who you are and where you're from, as well as any questions you have for today's speakers. We're pleased to welcome today's speakers to the call. This includes Jennifer Hennebury from is, who is the Regional Chronic Disease Prevention and Management Manager for Diabetes Services at Western Health in Newfoundland and Labrador. Jennifer was a member of the CFHI project team for Western Health in her previous role as the Regional Self-Management Coordinator. In her new management role, Jennifer assumes the lead for sustaining and, and expanding self-management within local diabetes teams in Western Health. Annette Harland is the Area Manager for Addiction and Mental Health Services in Charlotte County and Child and Youth Services in St. John, including Pier 126 and Early Psychosis. Annette received a Bachelor of Social Work degree from St. Thomas University and a Master of Social Work from Dalhousie University. For the past four years, she has provided leadership in the implementation of integrated service delivery for children, youth, and families in Charlotte County, the development of Pier 126, and is a member of the Provincial Center of Excellence Committee. Patty Darling is the clinical liaison for Pier 126 and counsels children and youth for community mental health services in St. John, New Brunswick. She is currently working towards certification in play therapy and TheraPlay. Patty is committed to the importance of recovery-based services and developing alternative means of providing community mental health programs. Lynn Edwards is the Senior Director for Primary Health Care and Chronic Disease Management at the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Most recently, health service, the Health Services Director of Primary Health Care and the District Department of Family Practice at Capital Health. Lynn has also held leadership roles in health delivery and research within the Department of Health and Wellness in Primary Health Care as the Director of Acute and Tertiary Care. Lynn is responsible for overall service planning of primary health care and chronic disease within Nova Scotia Health Authority. Tara Sampali is the Assistant Director for Quality and Research in Primary Health Care, also with the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and Assistant Professor of Medical Informatics at, the, at Dalhousie University. Holding a PhD degree in health informatics, Dr. Sampali effectively blends research with practice, bringing the novel concept of embedded research into healthcare. Her research interests include chronic disease management and multimorbidities, integrated models of care, knowledge management, and application of innovative IT solutions in healthcare. Today we also have our producers, Sheena Powell and Kelly Ripley, operating behind the scenes here in Ottawa. And I'm joined alongside with my colleague, Claudia Meyer, Improvement Lead, who, are, who was instrumental in the development of the Atlantic Healthcare Collaboration back in 2012. We're happy to welcome folks back to the second of three webinars who took part in the first webinar on October 22nd, where we looked at self-management strategies for healthcare improvement. For those new to the series and joining us today, let's kick off with a brief overview of the objectives we laid out here over the course of the series. We've set out to demonstrate solutions for making the shift from disease-oriented care to patient and family-centered care that meet people where they are. Profile the experience of teams scaling their improvement projects and spreading them across delivery systems. And assess strategies for motivating the clinical front line to make disruptive change to improve chronic care for patients and families. 
In today's session, we're going to hear from three Atlantic healthcare improvement teams from Newfoundland, Labrador, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. Each team will present on their process undertaken to improvement, their mechanisms for sustaining, and in some cases, spreading, their work, how they integrated patient-centered frameworks into their work, and finally, share lessons learned for you for undertaking collaborative quality improvement approaches to chronic disease improvement. With that, let's get started. So I'm happy to now introduce our first speaker today, Jennifer Henbury from Western Health Newfoundland and Labrador to kick us off. Jennifer, over to you. Thanks so much. I'm going to be reporting on Western Health project. So just to start, um, our journey here at Western Health certainly started with um, a new strategic goal for the organization, and this was around improving outcomes for residents with diabetes. The focus of the strategic goal stemmed from our province having one of the highest rates of diabetes in the country, as well as an environmental scan that identified many opportunities for improvement within our current services. We started on what was to be a full rebuild of diabetes services, and Western Health had adopted the expanded chronic care model to guide its work in chronic disease prevention and management. We recognized that self-management was a key strategy in this model to achieving optimal care. So when we looked at best practices and emerging trends and through our partnership with CFHI, we recognized that this was one of our major weaknesses was the integration of a self-management approach. Um, in the province as well as in, in our region, there was already a best practice self-management program that was implemented um, and this really provided a solid foundation for patient self-management. However, we had not taken a close look at how our staff in diabetes could support this type of approach um, and specific strategies to promote self-management support had not been identified. So like most models, our model at the time was primarily focused on educating our clients and our providers often felt frustrated when the clients didn't adhere to the recommendations. Um, we really wanted to put more of a focus on helping clients build decision-making skills, how to connect more to communities, goal setting, problem solving, and those sorts of things. So just a very high level overview of our project. Um, when Western Health, as I mentioned, when, when we connected with the Kane Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, we, um, we were already looking at diabetes services. Um, so this was, again, a part of a, a broader strategic goal, um, but this partnership certainly provided an excellent opportunity to embed self-management uh, into our new service delivery model. And again, not as a part of this project, but prior to starting this project, there was seven diabetes service teams established, and these teams were really the focus of this improvement initiative. So again, at a high level, um, we did a pretest to determine um, a baseline for self-management support. We identified priority areas based on the findings of the pretest. We identified strategies, and then we implemented those strategies, and then we did an evaluation. Now we'll talk about those pieces in the next few slides. So to measure our baseline status of self-management support within the teams, we use the best practice tool, which is a PCRS tool, which is short for the primary care resources and supports for chronic disease self-management. So this tool really helped us focus our efforts appropriately as the priority areas were identified by the diabetes providers themselves. And it also helped us measure our success and for the teams to be able to see their success as the, this tool was also used as a post-test, and then we compare both results. So this was uh, Western Health Doodle that was created by CFHI to represent our project. Um, the three areas that were identified on the left-hand side of the screen were the three areas identified for improvement based on results from the PCRS tool. So from the left-hand side, there's emotional health, patient input, and staff training and education on self-management support. So within each of the focus areas, we identified sh several strategies for improvement. I won't go into detail about those strategies due to um, time, but we do have uh, additional resources if you guys are interested. So we also try to incorporate self-management um, into all of our program design. So, for example, this is our new brochure that we developed, and we used a champion client that had 
really grasp the concept of self-management early on. Um, as well as the brochure, we introduced a client passport that is a self-management tool. We redesigned our intake process to be more collaborative, and we also included uh, structured goal setting as a part of our treatment. So that's just some of the things that we did as a part of the project. In terms of outcomes and impact, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in the next coming slides. So to evaluate our outcomes, we surveyed active clients within diabetes services and included in the survey was, again, another standardized tool. Um, this was the PACIC, which is known as the Patient Assessment of Chronic Illness Care, and I will talk about that further. We also conducted a confidence and attitude survey with the providers around self-management support at three different intervals throughout the improvement project. And then we conducted the post-PCRS tool to determine our overall success after implementation. So in terms of the team, the provider evaluation, so this was the result of our confidence surveys that we administered throughout the project. And as I mentioned, we administered at three different times. So we administered the survey at baseline, which was prior to any specific training and self-management support. Then several months later, we did a pretest, and this was just prior to a two-day self-management support education session with Dr. Vallis. And then following the two-day session with Dr. Rouse, we also reevaluated again. So, and I know this is a bit of a busy slide, but at baseline, uh, overall the providers reported a relatively high level of confidence in all competencies. And after this uh, baseline, we did introduce some concepts of self-management support through in-services, and we had um, introduced a couple new policies around self-management support. Then we conducted the pretest results, and this showed a decrease in overall confidence in almost all the competencies. So this may be attributed to the fact that providers now had a better understanding of the concepts of self-management support and understood that they weren't actually practicing entirely from this perspective. And then the uh, post post. Uh, results, and this was following the two-day training with Dr. Vallis, again, we saw another increase in confidence. So we really felt that, you know, the workshop was successful in strengthening the self-management support competencies of the staff, and one of the most significant improvements was related to uh, readiness of change. And this was certainly a skill that was identified throughout the workshop um, as a weakness among providers, so we really focused on that. We also evaluated provider beliefs and attitudes around self-management support um, and found that they had certainly changed throughout the project. So we, eval we evaluated six individual practices, So, and I don't have the results actually on the slide, but from baseline to the end of the project, there was more of an importance on client self-management self -management actions and less importance placed on provider actions. So it was an indication that providers felt that the client behavior was more important relative to provider behaviors demonstrating, you know, self-management. Um, and it was also anticipated that there would be a shift in importance from traditional patient education model to self-management support. And this prediction uh, certainly proved accurate as there was a decreased importance of giving expert advice and there was the same or an increasing level of importance of providing um, problem-solving skills and collaboration and goal-setting. So this was certainly more evidence to support that the providers are moving away from the medical model of care and really moving into more of that behavior change model. So this is, um, again, after the implementation, we conducted the PCRS tool once again um, and compared it with the pretest results. So um, on average, as you can see there, the pretest being in red, post-test being in blue, um, scores increase for, for each of the 16 characteristics in the tool. So the three areas of improvement um, that we had certainly focused on was emotional health right here, um, as well as patient input and um, education for staff. So these three characteristics characteristics had the greatest increase from pretest to post-test. Um, and there was also a significant increase in uh, ongoing quality improvement. And this had an increase of, again, over four points. And this was not surprising to see because this increase uh, certainly spoke to the fact that our initiatives, including the PCRS tool, was 
um, a quality improvement tool itself. So the client survey that I mentioned, um, it included the PACIC, which is, again, a best practice tool. And this is a 20-item patient report instrument that assesses a patient's receipt of clinical services and actions that are consistent with the chronic care model. And uh, this tool is certainly uh, supported in the literature as being an effective measure to, uh, of best practices for chronic disease. So we did set a target of four as a benchmark for quality, and despite being close to four, there was two areas that we didn't meet the benchmark. Uh, patient activation was one uh, three, at 3.7, and follow-up and coordination of care score, and that was 3.94. So again, we never got to four in those areas, but we certainly came close. Um, we were satisfied with these results as, you know, we, we really felt that this was another indication that the providers were using the self-management support skills. So in terms of our organizational outcomes, again, we did a complete redesign of diabetes services to support a self-management mo model. Um, we did introduce decision support tools such as a depression screener tool, and we developed policies guiding um, guiding these tools as well as guiding the approach, and, um, and that is included in the uh, doodle that I showed earlier. And we are continuing to provide educational opportunities to staff and have continued with uh, our community practice, which again was another strategy we started with the initiative. We are sharing our work with other regions in the province, such as Labrador Grenfell Health and Eastern Health, and we've been sharing our work through webinars such as these. We've also been sharing our work throughout the organization um, through, again, presentations to senior management and the board of directors. And right now within the organization, there's a new strategic goal focusing on cardiac health. And they have um, seen our work and are looking at ways to implement the PCRS tool to determine how they can implement a self-management approach within cardiac health. And we've also developed a basic self-management support education module, and that will soon be available for staff in the organization. And we've received very good response from managers to the importance of adding this module as a core competency for their staff. So we're certainly proud of where we've traveled. Um, you know, we do have an appreciation that implementing self-management support concepts is very challenging, and it is very different from your traditional model, so it does take a lot of dedicated time and effort. Um, just a couple contributors, I guess, to our success. Careful planning is certainly um, something that we focused on. The use of standardized tools. We did use several standardized tools, and we felt that um, we were able to get some valid results from those. The engagement of all parties, and that includes, you know, staff to patients right up through to leadership. And, you know, we were lucky to have leadership support because it was a part of the strategic goal. Uh, organizational readiness is another important factor to consider and support for sustainability. And um, certainly learning from our project was that, um, you know, there's, there's definitely a need for multiple strategies and reinforcement to bring about uh, a big change such as this one. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. I see um, on the line, Jen Verma has joined us virtually today from Halifax. Jen is our Senior Director of Collaboration for Innovation and Improvement here at CFHI and, and initiated the development of the EHC. So glad to have, glad to see you're joining us, Jen. And I'd also like to mention on the line, uh, Peggy Dunbar and Michael Vallis have, have tuned in today. These folks were coaches with the Western Health team um, and part of the overall coaching strategy with the Atlantic Healthcare Collaboration. So glad to have you guys on the line with us today. So we'll now move uh, to hear from Pier 126 and their experience in New Brunswick, and then we'll actually pause briefly to take any questions for the first two teams. So a reminder to folks that you can use the chat box feature to the right of your screen to ask questions to our speakers. So Patty, Annette, over to you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk to you today about our journey in developing a, a recovery-based program and what that what uh, Peer 126 is all about um, and how it has been a real shift in the way we have typically uh, delivered addictions and mental health services, certainly in New Brunswick. So Peer stands for Peers Engaged in Education and Recovery. And this, uh, 
our journey started back in uh, January 2012 when uh, we received um, some funding from Medivy Blue Cross, uh, Medivy, sorry, Medivy Health Foundation. So in collaboration with Horizon and Medivy, we developed a youth recovery program which is located in our uh, uptown of St. John. What we wanted to, to look at is creating um, a storefront operation that would hopefully allow us to access a different group of young people between the ages of 16 and 29 who we knew were not necessarily accessing the formal system but were, were um, in need of some addictions and mental health services. So we know that um, the statistics are pretty dire in terms of the number of youth who actually access services. So about 25% of youth who need services actually receive services. And we also know that suicide is, is the leading, leading cause of death between youth ages 15 and 24. And in New Brunswick, unfortunately, we have um, a, hospital, a rate of hospitalization for youth that is twice the national rate. So what we were very clear on was the fact that um, our formal system was not uh, creating, the ki or, uh, creating the kinds of services that were needed by this particular age group. So Pier 126 is um, comprised of a team of professionals. It's made up of human service counselors, trained peer support workers, and a clinical liaison. Um, who provide programming and, a, a, as I said, a storefront operation um, in a facility off-site from our typical addictions and mental health programming. And um, the use of peer supporters has been um, a very um, unique addition to our service delivery. And I'm going to let uh, Patty talk a little bit about, Pat, uh, about peer supporters. So peer supporters are essential to the service that we provide. Currently we, provide, we have one full-time and one part-time peer supporter. Um, and a peer supporter is an individual who's living in recovery with a mental health or, or substance abuse issue. Um, they provide one-on-one -on -one support, act as a role model for recovery, and facilitate many of the activities that we provide in our center. Our members at Pier 126 are ages 16 to 29, have an addictions or mental health concern, and are attempting to live a life of recovery. We use the term member instead of clients because it's less formal and for many it implies more control of participation and ownership of their recovery plan. The second thing to note that's important from this slide is that um, peer does not require a formal diagnosis. If somebody walks in off the street and tells us that they're having concerns with their mental health or an addictions issue, we take them at their word. At Peer 126, members may be referred by a third party or self-refer. They may also come in and out of our service as needed. There's no complicated intake and typically no wait time until participation is, is permitted. Our process does include an initial talk and tour where the potential members get to see Pier 126, given a calendar of events and programs for consideration. Upon their second visit, we ask that a member registration be completed, and when the member is ready, the human service worker will sit with them to discuss their goals and develop an individualized recovery plan. Our program doesn't require that members be open with our mental health clinic. However, if they'd like to become connected at some point, the clinical liaison, which is myself, can assist with this process and even complete the intake at PEER if it's appropriate. PEER 126 is PEER-led. It's part of the continuum of services with the addictions and mental health program. It's community-based, it's recovery-based, and it links members to both formal and informal services as desired. Yeah. So 
Pier 126 offers an alternative to the traditional intake through mental health for counseling or psychiatric consult. The recovery process is always individual and not everyone's looking for the same types of support. However, what everybody has in common is that we typically do better when we have support in our lives. The Pier 126 model provides informal and formal support when it's needed and where it's needed. Our service is very flexible and support may occur at peer, in the community, in collaboration with other service providers, can occur at school, in a person's home, or it can uh, support the clinician's efforts at the mental health clinic. At peer, we strive to empower the members, encourage informed and supportive decision making, create individualized wellness plans, provide ongoing support and goal review, as well as customized plans for participation as required. I love this slide. Um, we do require that a person is attempting to live a life of recovery. However, everyone's recovery journey is different. Ups and downs are expected and we support members through good times and bad. It's important to ensure that one person's relapse does not affect another person's recovery. Recovery goals are individualized, as I mentioned before. This can mean that participation with Pier 126 may look different at different stages of recovery. Member goals can be very specific, such as making a friend, leaving your house, even just staying awake during the day so that they sleep at night, um, being sober, going to school, getting a job, or finding safe and affordable housing. We ensure that everybody's recovery journey is tailored to meet their needs. So a few of the lessons learned um, for us along this journey. Um, <clears throat> the uh, development of peer support workers as part of our service delivery has been a very enriching experience, both for us as um, clinicians and administrators, as well as for our clients. However, the challenge is that in New Brunswick, there is not a formalized um, system of support for peer supporters. So. It, um, we have no, no um, mechanism by which to ensure that the, the um, appropriate, um, I've lost my train of thought, sorry, uh, that the uh, appropriate re remuneration is provided to peer supporters. They're not part of any contracted, um, they're not part of any of our uh, discipline contracts. So the province is now in a mode of catch-up and we are trying to look at that and have some standardized training for peer supporters and get them into an actualized position. Location has also been one of the other issues that we've experienced. While we have a phenomenally welcoming um, location in Uptown St. John, and in case you're not familiar with St. John, our downtown is considered Uptown. Um, <laughs> It's, it, it's in a old brownstone, it's lovely, it's on the street front, it's in a perfect location for that particular area and we're able to, um, it, it's in a great catchment area for the uptown area. However, it negates being able to provide services to people who are even 10 kilometers away. Transportation is, is very challenging in our city. So what we are now looking at uh, trying to provide is increased outreach services and um, expand our programming so that we can reach an even broader group of uh, members. The linkage is, um, so when Peer 126 was established, it was established as a youth recovery program and it had some informal linkages with the uh, formal system. And over the last couple of years, what we have done is enhanced those linkages to ensure that if a, if a young person walks through the door at Pier 126 and requires services from the formal system, we're able to provide that intake and opportunity for services right at that door. So it's not about transferring them, it's not about redirecting them to another part of the service, it's about providing that service there and then and ensuring that they, um, that, that they are then connected to the right part of the system. 
that continues, we are um, continuing to evolve in terms of formalizing our linkages, and that's been very, uh, very, very positive. When uh, we began this journey in 2012, the decision was made at that time to look at an age criteria of 16 to 29. Um, what we knew was that we really wanted to target this age group of emerging adults. However, in hindsight, um, the 25 to 29 year grouping is probably high. It's, it's on the high end of the um, age criteria. And as we continue to evolve, we will probably look at a demographic of 16 to 24. Um, the difference between a 29-year-old and a 16-year-old is really significant, and so we've we've had to develop programming that addresses, again, both those um, ends of the spectrum. So I, I think in terms of an age criteria, 16 to 24 would probably be more appropriate. And our, our one of our last um, reflections was around programming. So as we've developed Pier 126, we have needed to stay very focused on what the needs are of the members are, who attend the, the program, the recovery program. And um, initially when, we, when our doors opened, there was a less focus on programming and um, more of a, a focus of creating a welcoming environment and um, connecting people to job skills, that kind of thing. As we've evolved, um, our members have said, have indicated more of the programming that they wanted to see. And we've tried to be very responsive to that. So our programming focuses on health and wellness, on um, uh, skill building, um, psychosocial skill building, um, uh, education, job skills, training. And we really take our direction from the members who are at peer and identify um, and what their needs, what the net needs are that they identify and then develop programming around that. And I think that's what keeps uh, Peer 126 relevant in terms of the service that we provide. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Patty. So we'll pause here for a quick moment just for uh, a reflection and Q&A uh, on the first two presentations. And we have a question came, that came through from Shauna directed for Jennifer. Jennifer, could you highlight how you scored patient activation and more details of the measures you used for success? Sure. Um, well, ultimately this had come from, again, the PACIC, and this is a standardized tool. Um, I guess I can share the link in the chat box there. Do that now, actually. So if you click on the link there, uh, this is the website for improving chronic illness care. So really what happens is the questions that are on the survey are categorized into uh, five different category, categories. So for example, questions number one through three are categorized under patient activation. So you take the responses from all the clients who we surveyed, um, and this was done through our um, quality risk management department. They had taken the surveys and conducted the actual evaluations. So you'd actually take the averages of those scores and that's the score you get for patient activation. But we really didn't change. Like we, we used the standardized tool as it was so that we could use that um, scoring schematic. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And folks on the line, you'll also see that Jen Verma inserted a link there um, on patient activation, a, an interesting report that was released from NHS. Uh, so if you follow that there, you'll be able to access that resource. So we'll now turn it over to Lynn and Tara uh, from Nova Scotia Health Authority, who is the third team to present today. So Lynn, Tara, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, good afternoon from sunny Halifax in Nova Scotia. I'm Tara Sampali, and thank you for providing us this opportunity to share the work done in Nova Scotia Health Authority Central Zone through the Atlantic Collaborative, 
Our initiative focused on improving care and care experiences for individuals with chronic conditions through system level transformation. When the Atlantic Collaborative Opportunity was presented to us in 2012, our first step was to engage teams to participate and to ensure that we could establish common goals and working relationships. Given that we were really trying to build an existing process, we recruited teams that showed readiness and willingness to participate. So we had four teams, three from primary health care, community health teams, diabetes management centers, integrated chronic care service, and the inspired COPD outreach program. Given the focus of care for these teams was so different, our work ended up being a system level exploration for chronic conditions across the continuum of care. Our full team was quite ex extensive, including many members from various departments, and most importantly, our team included patient advisors. The common goal of exploration was from the perspective of individuals with multiple chronic conditions, and how we might come together to improve care and care experiences for these individuals. Although we had knowledge from evidence, we had limited understanding of our local data and opportunities for improvement. This slide shows the extensive work that was done in this collaborative. It was truly exploratory as we continue to learn about the current state from evidence, experience, and value-based knowledge. Our initial work also focused on establishing relationships with the four teams. Our work was primarily grounded in the principles of the expanded chronic care model, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. We introduced these principles in many aspects of our work, such as developing baseline understanding of the four service areas, in the use of validated surveys, and in interviews used to engage stakeholders. We also used the Working Together tool developed and validated in Primary Healthcare Central Zone to establish and agree upon the type of partnerships among the four teams in the context of this work. Finally, we developed a modified value stream mapping methodology to align with the chronic care model. As many of you may know, value stream mapping is a lean methodology and is essentially about walking your patient footsteps to understand value-based perspectives. This slide recaps some of the novelties of our work. We also developed a corridor approach at the system level, which Lynn will speak to you later in this presentation. This slide shows how we plan to measure the impact of our work and outcomes. As you will notice, the immediate outcomes are all mainly process-based. We'll get to some of the triple aim outcomes such as experience, population level outcomes, and efficiencies down the road. We did have some immediate outcomes that have validated our efforts for improvement. These include development of a modified value stream methodology, the corridor approach, hosting a symposium, publishing our work, and the initial success of one of the participating service areas, which I'll quickly share with you now. The integrated chronic care service is part of primary health care and treats individuals with complex chronic conditions and multimorbidities. This service went through all the recommended steps of our initiatives such as engaging patients and providers, value stream mapping, to arrive at value-based improvements that were at the system level and improvements that were specific to the service. So My Care, My Voice initiative is a service-specific initiative for ICCS. This initiative is about bringing patients' voice to care delivery process and complex chronic care management. Based on the review and feedback from patients and other stakeholders, many important value-based improvements were identified as listed in the slide, including removing wait times to receive care. Another view of what we were learning from the stakeholder engagement, we could see opportunities to improve at the intake and follow-up care in patient activation and in our communication with patients and referent clinicians. We introduced many value-based changes at a service level based on the feedback that have improved patient engagement and inclusion in care. We really took advantage of what the patients were telling us as being important to them. Most often it is not that the patients are complex, but our service delivery that can be complex and a barrier to successful engagement, better care, and better outcomes. Just from listening to our patients, we introduced some simple but more important changes to our intake process at ICCS, which has improved patient satisfaction and experience of primary outcomes as a primary outcome. But as a secondary outcome, we reduced wait times from 13 months in 2012 to a week in 2015. This is a wonderful success story for our patients, our care team, but also for this collaborative. ICCS went on to win the 3M National Team Award this year for their work. With this, I'll pass it over to Lynn to share our system level work and outcomes. Thank you, Tara. So, um, in an effort to build on our lessons learned throughout our journey, 
Disease Prevention Management Corridor. The corridor is a streamlined process that takes the Wagner Chronic Care Model from a conceptual model to an action-oriented process to be applied across settings and programs that are designed to support individuals living with chronic conditions. There are three components of the corridor. They include service delivery redesign, common elements, and a hub of support. The corridor process is intended to be applied to two or more programs going through this um, refined journey at the same time. The service delivery redesign has five key steps. That was streamlined from the earlier process that we used that, share, that Tara identified um, in the earlier part of the presentation. So in streamlining the service delivery um, process, I wanted to highlight three key areas. One is in the establishment of baseline, it was critically important to establish trust among the programs. In sharing the results of what was working well and what wasn't working well across the programs, we know this to be the case um, to go forward, that trust was an enabler to allow us to share our faults and learn from each other's successes and failures. The current state value stream mapping, as Tara has identified, is critically important, the modified approach, and that remains a key element in the service delivery redesign in this, in this corridor. The other piece that I'd like to highlight is the working together framework, which allows multiple programs, multiple providers, and or organizational units to determine how they will work together. It forces the conversations around, um, are we duplicating any resources? Are there any resources that we could be supporting um, our, our, our clients differently, our patients differently? The next, the next component of our model um, are the common elements. And the common elements are um, designed to provide some crossover or consistency between the programs amongst providers who are providing those programs and settings so that we can enhance the journey for our patients. The, most of these elements are actually, they align with the um, Wagner chronic care model, but the ones that we have added or enhanced, I just want to take a moment to identify. We've enhanced the focus on functional health. That has been um, raised in profile among the programs that have gone through this um, corridor journey. We have enhanced the clinical information system. So in Nova Scotia, we do not have one patient, one record. It is uh, a desired vision and goal in the future. Until that time, we're looking at how we consistently collect information. So a good example would be through our um, collaborative, we identified, through the CFHI collaborative, we identified that our individuals, our patients who have chronic conditions and may have two or more chronic conditions and see a variety of providers will be asked the same information in different ways or maybe even in the same way a multiple number of times. So we're looking at streamlining um, multiple pieces of our information system, including our intake. The importance of identifying um, and supporting chronic disease management competencies in our professionals has been added highlighting self-management. Along with that, we have added education, health literacy, and care pathways. The third component of our, um, of our corridor is the hub of support, so the project hub. And in there, we've identified the critical importance of leadership. That's one that I want to um, make sure that I, 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 I address. That was critical during our journey, and we know that that main, remains to be critical going forward. Someone who holds the leadership, the, ex, the understanding, and the vision of looking at a, a consistent journey for our individuals with chronic conditions. And the expertise mentorship pool. Um, going forward, it's critically important for us to be identifying where the experts are. If they're in one program or one, one part of the system, one site, it's we have been identifying ways where we can share that expertise and mentor one another. So we have, um, we have had the opportunity to have a symposium, as, as Tara has alluded to, and share this with 300 people across our province. We have presented internationally on the corridor and the work from the CFHI Collaborative with the support from CFHI enable, enabling us to do that. 
we have we will be using from a spread perspective the corridor as we start ramping up our chronic disease um, prevention management planning across the new Nova Scotia Health Authority. That, pro, that um, team has not been established yet, but um, it's part of the plan for that team. We have um, continued to work on the common intake form, for, and that, again, we'll be looking at it across the province and building capacity in our, in our provincial supports for um, performance excellence through our sorry, for performance excellence, process engineering, and IT. We also have a number of tools that we used and we streamlined and built on those tools and that toolkit is under development so that other people could apply our learnings and um, take that conceptual framework and move it into an action-oriented process. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Tara. So we now have an opportunity to take some questions. So folks on the line, please use the chat box to ask your questions to any of our presenters today. So while we wait for questions to filter in, I'd like to just reflect back to um, something that came in the chat box earlier, uh, just a comment, and turn it over back to Jennifer. Jennifer, could you share some more detail on how the patient passport came to fruition and any plans to continue uh, to develop it, develop it in the future? The patient passport, again, was something that was a part of the strategic goal, and it's it's very similar to a passport. It's kind of like you would fold it out as you would your passport. And on there includes, um, there is a goal card that uh, the providers would use with their patients. But it's really a spot where patients can um, record their lab values, blood pressures, blood sugars, cholesterol, anything relevant to their condition. And then they're encouraged to take that when they go visit their family doctor or when they go visit their specialist. And any blood work that they get that's updated, then either their physician, specialist, or themselves would write that down. So again, it just it's a tool that really promotes the client client's involvement, I guess, in their care. And you know, that's something that is um, discussed in the chronic disease self management program that we have here at Western Health. So clients are really encouraged to um, take ownership and to ask questions about their care. So I guess that's the tool that, you know, helps promote that aspect of self-management. Thanks, Jennifer. And just acknowledging that I know you have, to, you have to leave a little bit early today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, our next Thanks. question. I'd just like to direct this one uh, over to Tara and Lynn first. So self-management support and patient activation certainly isn't new, but why are we challenged in putting it into practice? So, Tara Lynn, over to you, and then we'll uh, then we'll uh, turn it over to um, to the Pier One Two Six folks for some reflections as well. So, I'll I'll try to answer, and Lynn, please feel free to join. So, patient activation and self management, although it seems like something that you know all of us are doing every day, it's really the the uh, challenge or the understanding that we need to understand is, is that it's not about us. It's really about the patients and where they might experience and how they might experience it. So part of our journey and our understanding is, although it is something that's embedded in our culture and it should be embedded in our practice, it's not always apparent to the patients using the service. And it's an exploration for us in terms of what might it look like from the patient level in terms of being activated, engaged, and what would self-management look like. So that's been our journey in understanding, you know, not only what tools, what outcomes will inform, but really what is our process around it that the patients can see and, you know, uh, be involved. So we are going to do a little bit of work with co-designing at some point because I don't think we fully understand and appreciate the concept. Yeah. I would just add to that that, I, that also as well organizationally we don't take the time always to respect that process that it takes to um, work with our clients, our patients, to enhance and to understand and to listen to, to um, what, 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 their, what their specific goals are. And um, we don't always provide appropriate supports to our team to ensure that they build the competency levels that are required. 
Wonderful. Thanks, folks. So, Annette, Patty, just wondering your, your reflections, your thoughts on some of those pieces related to self-management support and patient activation and, and you know, those, those challenges we have in putting that into practice. Well, our whole program at Pier 126 is, is based on um, a recovery model, which puts the um, member or the client in the driver's seat. And, um, you know, the last speaker talked about the fact that sometimes we don't um, take enough time or focus enough in terms of what um, the member or client is actually saying and what their goals are. And it's very different, difficult, I think, at times for clinicians to step back and really listen and hear as opposed to um, putting in place or, or um, imposing what they see as being the need. It really shifts the focus of service delivery when we keep the client member in the driver's seat and see ourselves as really being the ones um, to facilitate or uh, go along this journey, but it's their journey. And I think staying focused on that for me has been one of the biggest shifts and has been what's so exciting about a recovery-based program like PEER when you think about it in relation to the more formalized, um, more clinically driven aspects of addictions and mental health. Patty, would you add anything? No, I think you said it beautifully. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'd just like to shift gears for a brief moment, and um, perhaps we'll, we'll turn this back over to you, um, Annette Patty, first. We'd just like to get your, your thoughts and uh, your reflections on how you're continuing to sustain, spread, and scale up uh, your work done at Peary 126 throughout your organization and your region. Well, that's always an interesting question. Um, so we are... We, we were uh, funded for a five-year project. Um, Horizon has uh, committed to the um, continuation at the end of those five years. So in 2017, we've agreed that um, we will maintain the peer support program. What that will look like, we are now in the throes of trying to figure that out. But New Brunswick is also involved in um, the National Access Project, which is improving um, access to for youth to addictions and mental health services. And so what we are looking at is becoming involved in a larger provincial strategy to create peer-like structures. Um, so for the Access Project, we're talking about them as being safe spaces where they are outside of the formalized system, but access points into whatever service is needed. Um, whatever identified services needed. And we're looking at expanding that role of um, what we call access clinician so that they are attached to the formalized system. They can provide um, a clinical service if that's what's needed, but that they are also navigators, navigators between the community and the formalized system. Um, so we really are in the throes of, of looking at what that's going to um, continue to evolve in the next few years. Great, thank you. So we've had uh, one last question coming from Shauna, and this will be for, for Lynn and Tara. Just wonder if you could speak a little bit more about your involvement with the primary, in, with primary care, sorry, in, in corridor there. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yes, when we originally applied the corridor, our experience has been to those program areas and not as much in the primary care system. So when we look at quality in primary care, um, we have a couple of groups currently who are exploring how that, how the elements within the corridor can be applied in primary care. We haven't, we haven't actually, um, we've, we've only implemented components of it in primary care, but not as a full package. And we're in the process of, like I said, trying to determine how we will do that and to what extent we can support our primary care teams to go through that journey because it is quite a labor-intensive journey and, and supports will be needed for them. Is that helpful, Donna? Wonderful. Thanks, Thanks Lynn. 
Um, and just wondering your thoughts as well on and if you could share any of your work to sustain, spread, and scale up some what you've done through your organization and region just before we wrap up. So in terms of the four teams that are participating right now, our efforts are in supporting them in their implementation points. So that all elements of what we identified will be uh, completed, but also in bringing a couple of teams on board who are not part of the process and trying to see if there's a sustainability component, if, if everything we planned and implemented applies to another service area. So that's also happening. And of course, our you know, concurrently engagement activities and, you know, listening to other people and other stakeholders in the organization and getting their viewpoints. But Lynn can speak to a little more. And then from a health authority, um, you know, with all the change in Nova Scotia, it's challenging, but it also provides a great opportunity. So we're engaged in, um, in planning for the primary health care system as we go forward. And um, the corridor, we purposely developed the corridor from our lessons learned through the collaborative. We purposely developed that so it was a tool that we could use for spread and scaling up. And um, we'll be, as I have mentioned already, we'll be looking at how that applies at the primary care practice level and also in the primary health care system, the components of the system that are offering chronic disease programs. Um, some, of, some of that work has been started, certainly at the primary care practice level. We have not started um, the chronic disease um, planning group that will look at that will look to this and determine how useful it is for them to move forward with. From a service delivery, the directors are in, in primary health care are um, aware of the corridor, and when we start looking at efficiencies in our system, we'll be using this process. Wonderful, thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Tara. So as we come to an end of this webinar, I would like to invite everyone uh, to our next webinar session in this series. So join us on December 11th at 12 o'clock Eastern Time, where we'll be joined by CFHI lead faculty, professor at l'Ecole Nationale d'Administration Publique and Canada Research Chair in Governance and Transformation, Jean-Louis Denis, alongside CFHI Improvement Lead, Claudia Amar as we learn about the approach taken to evaluate the Atlantic collaboration and look at some of the overall collaborative results and share our learning for running, sustaining, and spreading a regional quality improvement initiative. You can see our full list of offerings at, at our on-call website at the link provided here on your screen. You should have also received information from CFHI on how to access additional resources related to this call. If you have not, rest assured we will recirculate this information following this call along with a full recording of this session. So we'll turn now to some live polling. So if you could please take a moment to fill out our quick polling survey that you now see on your screen, that'd be greatly appreciated. I'd like to take a moment just to thank all of our presenters for their excellent presentations today and for our producers, Kelly and Sheena, for working behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. Thanks to all of you for attending this session and your participation in today's discussion, and we look forward to your joining us on the final series webinar on December 11th. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you. This now concludes the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your line and have a great day.